Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Anne-Marie Houghton, and I'm a member of the Educational Research Department, amongst other things. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to one of our educational seminars, which offers food for thought and a real refreshment. This is one of our interdisciplinary research seminars. Uh, the seminar for information is being live streamed for off campus postgraduate students, staff and other interested people who can ask questions at the end of the presentation using their computer audio or via the chat box. And just for information, the session is going to be recorded and the recording will be available on the departmental website. If I could invite all attendees to switch off their cameras and mute their microphones during the presentation. So, as I said, my name is Anne-Marie Houghton and for those who may have a visual impairment, I have grey white hair, I'm wearing glasses, uh, I'm a wheelchair user, although you can't actually see that, and I'm sitting in front of one of Lancaster University's many screen backings, which is of a blue sky with white clouds, typical in fact of today, where we do have that very blue sky. And it's in front of our Ruskin Library Centre with some flowers as well. Um, but I'm not actually sitting there, I'm sitting in my office. Anyway, I'm now delighted to be able to introduce uh, our speaker, who is Marco Valero Sanchez. And Marco has been working with me um, since last June as a visiting researcher. Although he hasn't actually been to Lancaster, we've been engaging in this visiting research process as on a, in a virtual way. And um, from a personal perspective and that of the research group that I oversee, REAP, which is Researching Equity, Access and Participation, we as a team have been certainly benefiting from um, Marco's really interesting contributions, the generous sharing of his research, and he's been at playing an active role in a number of other networks around the university, including our inclusive learning network, and also our disabled employees network, where he gave a, a very practically focused um, presentation on some of the issues emerging from his research. So it is with my pleasure that I'm uh, going to introduce Marco, who's going to share his understanding disability disclosure in academia. I'm going to hand over to you, Marco. I shall also turn off my microphone and camera and see you, as they say, on the other side. Yeah, thank you very much, Emery, um, for the lovely introduction. Uh, I truly appreciate your words. And uh, yeah, I would be happy to share some beautiful background as well. But I decided to share my kitchen background, which is uh, also some kind of nice. Um, a great thank you to the Department of Educational Research and the organizing team of the seminar series for having me today. Uh, I'm absolutely grateful for the opportunity to talk about a highly important topic, both personally and professionally. As Emery already said, my name is Marco Valero Sanchez, but Marco is absolutely fine. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm a researcher and PhD candidate in sociology at the Leibniz University Hanover in Germany. Currently, I am a visiting researcher at Lancaster University and associated with REAP, researching equity, access, and participation within the Department of Educational Research. In today's presentation, I want to give you some insights into my PhD project in which I am focusing on inclusion, participation, and ableism in academia. In particular, my research examines issues of disability disclosure, mental health, and managing employment conditions and career prospects in academia. In today's seminar, I will explore the lived experiences of disclosure by academics with invisible disabilities, having conducted a qualitative interview study at German universities. Before we continue with today's presentation, I want to make you aware that this presentation contains a content warning and a trigger warning. As the description of the seminar already implies, this presentation will address lived experiences of disability disclosure, 
ableism and sanism in academia. The material may contain interview content or pictures that may be hurtful, disturbing, or even traumatizing to some people. So if you ever feel the need to step out of the seminar, you may always do so without any consequences. In addition, I will copy the link from the Counseling and Mental Health Service at Lancaster University in the chat in case you are confronted with some unanticipated content and would like to seek some professional help after the presentation. And let's see if this works as I predicted. So here it is. During the presentation, I will discuss first the social construction of invisible disabilities, as I believe this will be important for the remainder of the talk. Subsequently, I will refer to previous research on disability disclosure in academia and give some theoretical conflict reflections on the connection between stigma and disability disclosure. Following an overview of the interviews and the methodology of my PhD project, I will present my own research findings on disability disclosure by academics with invisible disabilities. The talk concludes with some considerations and an outlook on further research, and I would be happy to discuss ideas and perspectives together afterwards. As mentioned before, I am particularly interested in the experiences of academics with invisible disabilities or so-called invisible disabilities. For today's talk, this raises the question of what I mean when I'm talking about invisible disabilities. So looking at the research literature, it becomes apparent that there is no single notion, but several definitions of the concept of invisible disabilities. The term itself can just be described as a fuzzy term. According to Matthews and Harrington, the term invisible disabilities refers to conditions that are not immediately apparent or noticeable to others. Compared to notions such as non-visible or hidden, invisible implies that the disability cannot be seen at all. Consequently, invisible disabilities can be understood as a social construction involving a wide range of physical, psychological, social, communicative, or sensory impairments that interfere with day-to-day -day functioning, but are unseen by others. These conditions include various types of mental illness, neurodivergence and neurological diseases, as well as autoimmune, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, or respiratory diseases. With their conditions being invisible to others, disabled people can usually decide for themselves whether or not, when, how, and to whom they disclose disability information. Invisible disabilities do not automatically reveal information about the person to others in social interactions. In this sense, social interactions are not shaped or defined by disability-related expectations, stereotypes, or prejudices. This suggests that the invisible nature of the disability may prevent people from being exposed to stigmatizing attitudes and responses. Invisible disabilities can vary in their origin, degree of severity, the extent of fluctuate, fluctuation, and whether they are life-threatening or chronic, progressive or stable. Moreover, Invisible disabilities cannot always be differentiated from visible ones because a condition can have both visible and invisible features. For example, in the case of eating disorders, Parkinson's disease, or multiple sclerosis. According to Prince, having an invisible disability is not a clear-cut clinical category or a dinged social identity. Instead, research suggests that visible and invisible disabilities should be considered along a spectrum of specific contexts and conditions. Being dependent on the social setting, specific disabilities are invisible unless a person engages in activities where the disability becomes visible or decides to disclose or is required to disclose to qualify for accommodations. 
So as long as the condition does not declare itself due to its severe severity or advanced stage, employees must consider whether it is beneficial to disclose their disabilities at work. They must reflect on what impact disability disclosure may have on their social and professional relationships, their mental health, and future career prospects. Keeping this in mind, deciding whether or not to disclose disability information in the workplace is one of the biggest challenges for people with invisible disabilities. For the most part, this is because disability disclosure is neither a singular nor an isolated event. Instead, disclosing an invisible condition can be understood as an ongoing process, taking place at different stages and times, involving various types of interaction. It does not happen all at once, nor does it happen once and for all, but occurs gradually to varying degrees in different contexts and spaces. Therefore, disclosing an invisible disability is a complex and multidimensional social process linked to disability identity, privilege, and representation. Disability disclosure is particularly difficult in neoliberal academia. In this place, overwork and high performance are valued, holidays and sick leave are minimized or even avoided, and employees are evaluated based on the financial value of the work. Within, the, within this environment, which is dominated by expectations of productivity and competitiveness, and where temporary short-term contracts are prevalent, many scholars feel they cannot be honest and open about their disabilities and keep them secret. They are expected to fulfill the demands of the able-bodied and able-minded worker who is hypersocial and communicative and who can perform to an excellent standard in everything all the time. This normative framework of able-bodiedness and able-mindedness leaves barely any room for admitting to fluctuating health conditions and talking about disability, chronic illness, or neurodivergence. In this respect, the academic's decision to disclose or not to disclose an invisible disability needs to be understood as a continuous cost-benefit analysis. However, disability disclosure in academia is not only or does not only pose a, uh, um, a challenge for disabled people in general, it is particularly difficult for queer people, black people, female academics and scholars with mental illness. In this regard, research shows that, for example, LGBTQ students with disabilities preferably choose to disclose contextually and strategically. This largely depends on whether the disability or LGBTQ identities are accepted and valued on campus and whether they are aiming for a specific goal with disclosure. In particular, transgender and neurodivergent students and transgender students with mental illness choose not to disclose their identities to avoid unanticipated consequences. These results are similar to the lived experiences of Black students with disabilities in higher education. Most commonly, Black students with disabilities choose not to disclose their conditions due to fear of being negatively stereotyped as academically incompetent based on racial identity and disability identity. This fear of being exposed to multiple stereotypes negatively affects students' motivation, self-worth, academic achievement, and relationships with faculty and peers. Concerning academic employment, non-tenured female academics are less likely to disclose their disabilities due to the fear of potential negative consequences for their academic careers. They choose not to share disability information to avoid becoming vulnerable to the prejudices of others. Women's disclosures are generally met with less understanding than men's, highlighting that disability disclosure in academia is not an isolated, but an intersectional issue. To avoid being stigmatized as weak, 
or treated badly by others, scholars with mental illness often feel unwilling or unable to disclose their disabilities. These individuals are frequently concerned that disability disclosure may affect tenure and promotion at the universities, and they are afraid of the possibility of not having their contract renewed or losing their job once they have revealed their conditions. As a result, academics with mental illness often choose to keep up appearances and fit in rather than revealing themselves as other. Consequently, disability disclosure in academia is often linked to the fear of negative reception or misrecognition. It is therefore an emotional and personal as much as a rational and public decision. As previously described, disabled scholars often hesitate to disclose their disabilities at work due to fear of stigma, professional disadvantages, and exclusion from the academy. If we take a look at the sociological literature on stigma, we cannot avoid the impact of Goffman stigma concept. I will therefore briefly go into Goffman's considerations, but expand them at crucial points and apply relevant aspects to my PhD project. So according to Goffman, the term stigma describes an attribute that is deeply discrediting and whose discrediting effect is very extensive. The term stigma refers to bodily signs of physical disorder that are incompatible with and deviate negatively from society's normative expectations of identity. So being a person with a discrediting attribute leads to the individual being deprived of full recognition as a normal person, thus becoming a person with a spoiled identity. Exploring the lived experiences of disability disclosure, Goffman's distinction between perceivable and non-perceivable stigma is crucial to me. So according to Goffman, when the individual stigma is visible and known to others, this individual becomes a discredited person. Discredited persons have to deal directly with the tension between society's normative expectations of identity and the departure from these expectations. Consequently, academics whose disabilities are visible or known to others do not have the opportunity to hide their conditions in social interactions. They often have to face disability-related stereotypes or prejudices from superiors and colleagues. However, if the individual stigma is invisible or unknown, the individual has the opportunity to escape the negative perceptions of others, thus becoming a discreditable person. By controlling impairment information, discreditable persons may be perceived and treated as normal by ensuring that others do not become aware of their stigma. Consequently, academics with invisible disabilities may use different strategies of information management to control information and present themselves as socially expected and accepted individuals. In response to criticisms of Goffman's stigma concept as being too vaguely and ill-defined and too individually focused, Link and Phelan have constructed a revised conceptualization of stigma, which considers hierarchical structures, control, and exclusion. In their definition, stigma exists when elements of labeling, stereotyping, separation, status loss, and discrimination co-occur in a power situation that allows these processes to unfold. Link and Phelan argue that it takes power to distinguish and label human differences, associate label differences with ne negative attributes, separate the labeled individuals to distinct groups of us and them, and make them experience status loss and discrimination. Applied to the university context, it could be argued that disabled academics are also embedded in power relations and hierarchical structures. Within these structures, they can be granted or denied essential opportunities for participation and access to prestigious leadership positions in academia. 
Disclosing an invisible disability could then lead to discrimination, loss of status or employment, and ultimately exclusion from the academy. So based on these theoretical reflections, I'm exploring the following questions within my research in this area. What does it mean to disclose or not to disclose an invisible disability in academia? What is involved in this process? And what are the consequences and implications for disabled scholars? To give some answers to all of these questions, I had the opportunity and huge privilege to conduct a qualitative research study with disabled academics at German universities using problem-centered interviews. Including a pre-test interview, I interviewed 22 academics with invisible disabilities for this study. However, to explore disability disclosure at different stages of the academic career, I considered 16 interviews for the interview sample. Those academics whose disabilities had been fully visible to others since the doctoral or postdoctoral phase, for example, by using mobility aids, or whose conditions were no longer present, for example, cancer, were not included in the interview sample. The main selection criterion was that scholars had completed their doctorate and were employed at a German university but had not reached a professorship. These scholars are most commonly referred to as postdocs in German academia. Due to ethical reasons, interviews were not required to provide documentation for their disabilities to participate in my study. However, I had a personal conversation with all participants prior to each interview in which they all self-reported their disabilities. And the types of disabilities experienced by participants included autoimmune diseases, gastrointestinal diseases, mental illness, neurological, and respiratory diseases. The problem-centered interviews were conducted as semi-structured, in-depth interviews using an interview guide. The interviews were conducted as, I call it, in-person interviews, taking place before the COVID-19 pandemic and online interviews during the pandemic and lasted between two and three and a half hours. During the interviews, academics were asked about different but interrelated main topics, ranging from experiences of disability and ableism in academia to disability disclosure, to employment conditions and career prospects. Concerning data analysis, I analyzed all interviews using the content structuring qualitative content analysis according to Cookart. This type of content analysis allowed for a combined deductive inductive procedure in which the individual case is analyzed holistically. It is characterized by a multi level process of category formation and coding. And in this process, all interviews are analyzed based on deductive categories from the interview guide and inductive categories that emerges from the interview material. So if we come to research findings of my study, it can be said that all participants described incidents during their academic careers in which disability information was shared to some extent with superiors, colleagues, or administration. Most commonly, Academics intentionally and voluntarily choose to talk about their conditions in social interactions. They usually consider it socially, physically, mentally, or professionally beneficial to reveal their disabilities, at least to a certain degree. In this respect, disability disclosure presents itself as a personal decision. This personal decision, however, is strongly embedded in the specific work environment and culture at universities, depending on the working conditions and the academics relationships of trust towards superiors and colleagues. Before individuals can share any disability information or confined in specific individuals at work, they need to feel secure either in their own position or with others. On the one hand, this requires a work environment and culture 
where individual differences are accepted, valued, and understood. And on the other hand, academics need to be sure that they will not suffer any repercussions when openly identifying as disabled. In this regard, most interviews illustrate that the academic's decision to disclose their disability is largely embedded in university power relations and hierarchical structures. While some scholars generally feel uncomfortable talking about their health condition, many participants are afraid that they will be pitied and patronized at work and no longer taken seriously as academics if they fully disclose their conditions. This concern is particularly evident among disabled female scholars. Disability disclosure in academia, or at least in my study, is therefore not, a, not only a personal and emotional, but also a risky and strategic decision. This decision in large part depends on being able to pass as non-disabled, feeling the need to disclose, or being willing to grant power by providing knowledge. Consequently, the term disability disclosure is not meant to imply that all details and circumstances of condition are fully or constantly publicized to others. It can involve elements of sharing and not sharing disability information at the same time. So while specific symptoms or diagnoses are disclosed relatively often throughout the academic's career, the extent and severity as well as the fluctuating and episodic nature of their conditions are frequently concealed. On the one hand, this is explained by the complexity of the conditions and the participants' uncertainty about how and what to tell about their disabilities. On the other hand, many disabled scholars do not want to be perceived as weak, unpredictable, or limited in performance, thereby risking or increasing the risk of not getting permanent employment in academia. They often internalize the notion that disabled academics are less efficient and capable than non-disabled scholars, preventing them from speaking openly about their disabilities. As a result, they work hard to prove themselves as equally productive and available to their, as their non-disabled peers and therefore fitting within their abled normative work environment. This situation is reflected by Barbara, a non-binary scholar with mental illness, um, and to, yeah, I I'm using um, pseudonyms for the interview participants, so this is not her real name, but I named her Barbara. Um, due to fear of social and professional repercussions, Barbara is reluctant to disclose her condition to her superiors as not to oppose the dominant discourse of the hyper-productive and efficient worker. I quote, I mean, what matters in the workplace is, do you perform or do you not perform? And if there is even the slightest suspicion that you have someone in front of you who is limited in performance, then the cards are stacked against you. You have to perform. You have to give more than 100% if possible. And if that doesn't work, then <laughs> that is why, of course, you think twice before disclosing something like this in public. In many interviews, disability disclosure does not entirely present as a personal decision. Instead, academics often describe situations where they have been deprived of the opportunity to share information consciously and voluntarily with others. In these instances, disability disclosure is enforced or imposed by superiors and coworkers or the participant's disability declaring itself. Concerning the latter, this involves situations where specific characteristics of a disability become visible or noticeable to others. Academics then are left with little or no choice to cover their conditions and pass as non-disabled. It also includes instances in which individuals are faced with a prolonged absence from the university, most commonly due to an unexpected hospital or clinic admission. These participants report having no choice but to share disability information to a certain degree. <laughs> Within these settings, 
academics usually give an optimistic outlook on their conditions. They want to assure their supervisors that they can still meet neoliberal performance expectations despite being hospitalized for the time being. In this way, they try to position themselves as reliable and fitting within academia, a place where chronic and fluctuating conditions are considered potentially undesirable or damaging to professional careers. Feeling forced to disclose solely due to their deteriorating health, many participants have internalized the notion that disabled academics need to prove themselves as valuable and productive before they are entitled to identify as disabled and address their individual needs. This situation is described by Florence, a female scholar with an autoimmune disease. After taking up a postdoctoral position, Florence feels compelled to disclose details about her autoimmune disease due to an unanticipated six month hospitalization. Having kept her disability secret during her studies and PhD, Florence fears for her academic career if she informs her supervisor about her condition. Although Florence has not yet set foot in the hospital, she already feels compelled or pressured to give a favorable prognosis on her condition to appease her supervisor. I quote, in the beginning, I explained that I'm in hospital now, but that everything will be certainly be sorted out again. So I pretended to be much more optimistic than I was. I remember that, but I was afraid that they would kick me out again if I somehow never showed up for the first six months. If it, if it had not come to hospitalization, I probably would not have disclosed my condition. I would have tried to conceal it instead and prove myself as a new employee first. This underlying power imbalance between academic leadership and staff, or more specifically between non-disabled and disabled peers, becomes even more apparent when superiors and staff share disability information without the individual's consent. Most commonly, academics report that supervisors comment on their disabilities in committee meetings and work sessions, or refer to their medical treatment to excuse their absence from these meetings. In other cases, the participant's disability status is disclosed to all coworkers, for example, to remind them of the academic's reduced teaching responsibilities. This situation is highlighted by Marie, a female scholar also with an autoimmune disease. Being granted a reduction in her teaching duties from three to two classes, Marie is frequently confronted with the administration sharing her disability status via email with the entire institute. As this practice continues despite the participants' complaints and existing data re protection regulations, <laughs> it illustrates how academic positions of hierarchy, power, and knowledge are used or even abused to expose disabled academics and differentiate them from non-disabled scholars. Considering the context of reduced teaching responsibilities, it may give the impression that disabled scholars are given preferential treatment over non-disabled colleagues, exposing them to potential discrimination. It also leads to disability being associated with a lack of ability and need for assistance, creating the risks of connecting disabled academics to multiple stereotypes, such as being lazy, weak, or limited in performance. As a result, this practice is highly damaging to the individual's long-term academic careers. It perpetuates the ableist notion of the highly productive non-disabled worker and the less efficient and capable disabled counterpart. I quote, and then these circular emails are regularly sent to the entire institute distribution list. And inside it says, my name, reduction due to severe disability. And I have already complained several times because I don't think it is anyone's business that I'm disabled. I don't even know all the people from this institute. And it still doesn't work until this day. They always act 
as if this is general knowledge somehow, or as if anyone needs to know this at all. With regard to disability disclosure in academia, a particular dynamic becomes apparent when it comes to navigating and negotiating disability. In particular, this can be said about mental illness. For this reason, the final part of the presentation will focus specifically on disability disclosure in relation to mental illness. So in this study, most participants, or nearly all participants with mental illness prefer not to fully disclose the disabilities during their academic careers. Given the impression that talking about mental illness is an utter taboo topic in academia, many scholars confined primarily in selected colleagues with whom they have developed a trusting relationship over time. However, informing superiors about their conditions poses a particular challenge. Most often, these academics choose to disclose disability information to seniors when it becomes physically or emotionally draining to cover the disabilities any longer. Avoiding disclosure of mental illness is, on the one hand, strongly influenced by negative attitudes towards other disabled employees and the fear of being exposed to stigma and exclusion. On the other hand, it is largely shaped by a broader social discourse around mental illness. Many academics are ashamed of their conditions and feel guilty or responsible for the way their health has developed. These individuals prefer not to disclose to avoid having to justify or explain their disabilities or being observed and patronized at work. They want to evade being constantly commented on their body and behavior by others, a concern particularly evident among scholars with eating disorders. Furthermore, these academics are afraid of being perceived as unreliable, incapable, or even crazy if they fully disclose their conditions. These concerns are amplified by the precarious employment conditions and job prospects in academia. This situation is highlighted in Laura's interview, a female academic with mental illness. Being employed on a fixed term basis, Laura fe fears for her long-term academic career and health stability if she informs her boss about her mental illness. I quote, I don't want them to think I am unreliable or incapable or that I'm different. I already feel different anyway. I don't want them to think that I'm crazy. I was certainly afraid that if I came out completely, it would affect my career at university. I was already scared of attending therapy, that if I didn't pay for it myself, I would not get tenure anymore. And I'm certainly worried that disclosure will have a negative impact on my health. Most interviews illustrate that Disclosure of mental illness is strongly associated with expectations of labeling, stereotyping, separation, status loss, and discrimination, all of which can be referred to as stigma. Participants often feel that mental disabilities have a different status than physical or organic disabilities. They believe that universities are better prepared for the latter, for example, by providing assistive technologies, or specific office equipment. In contrast, when it comes to mental illness, they are uncertain how superiors would respond to their disabilities and doubt that they would still trust them with teaching and supervising students. For some academics, this involves feeling pressured to disclose their non-mental conditions so that others do not assume they are experiencing mental illness. These academics want to prevent prolonged periods of illness or absence from the university from being wrongly associated with mental illness. While many scholars avoid disclosure during their studies to be accepted by fellow students and experience a sense of belonging among peers, this rationale changes during academic employment and the doctoral and postdoctoral phase. 
At this point, participants are mainly concerned with being taken seriously as academics, trusted with work and responsibilities, and meeting performance expectations. This objective seems to be imposed by mental illness. Moreover, they do not want to raise concerns that they may drop out of work eventually due to their health conditions, as they avoid making themselves even more vulnerable some scholars develop a particular dynamic of disability disclosure in relation to mental illness. They choose to disclose only their non-mental conditions when both mental and non-mental illnesses are present. This phenomenon is reflected by Tilda, who feels more comfortable talking about her autoimmune disease than her psychological condition at work. I quote, I have the feeling that this is quite different, that society looks as mental, at mental illnesses in a slightly different way than at physical conditions. And I didn't want to expose myself to this embarrassment. And I also have the feeling that for me, it is even more personal than physical conditions. So I don't think it is anyone's business. I would not openly say I am being treated for an anxiety disorder, but I would openly say I am being treated for my rheumatic disease. So in this respect, the interviews highlight the difficulty of disclosing mental illness in academia, an environment almost entirely fostered around cerebral work. Being embedded in the dominant discourse around mental illness in university contexts, many academics I've interviewed feel pressured to keep their conditions to themselves to avoid social and professional repercussions. Compared to scholars with non-mental disabilities, the participants' fear of stigma and exclusion in relation to mental illness is even more pronounced on a personal and professional level. So overall, the participants' interviews illustrate the emotional burden and pressure of navigating academia with invisible disabilities. While negotiating disability, many scholars constantly try to present themselves as academically expected and accepted individuals. Feeling pressure to cover certain disabilities or their episodic and fluctuating nature while doing research, teaching and training is not only time and energy consuming. Above all, it is a continuous physical and mental barrier. The research results further show that disability disclosure is closely linked to the precarious employment conditions and career prospects in academia. In this context, neoliberal standards of performance and productivity strongly affect disability disclosure in academia. By selectively disclosing and thereby controlling disability information, most disabled scholars try to protect themselves from stigmatizing attitudes and responses and exclusion from the academy. In situations where they are forced to disclose or even outed by others, these scholars no longer have the opportunity to control disability information and determine whether they want to openly identify as disabled. In this perspective, they are deliberately exposed to ableism and sanism in academia. So this is the last slide, um, and I was asked to present some considerations and ideas for further research. So while doing the research study with disabled academics, I realized that for the most part, uh, I have well, <laughs> or entirely interviewed academics who have progressed to what we call in Germany, the postdoctoral phase. What might be crucial and important to have a look at are the experiences of ableism and disability disclosure of disabled academics who have left academia and determines the reason and their journey out of the academic system. Moreover, I have interviewed people, first of all, using the method of interviews and in-person and online interviews as a specific research method. So for further research, it would be crucial or to reflect on how to address and how to 
read disabled academics who prefer other forms of communication. And last but not least, most of or nearly all of the inter participants I've interviewed are white and from the global north, as we would say. Research on students with disabilities show that there are intersecting identities and discrimination experienced in higher education. So for further research on disability disclosure, it would be important to have a more intersectional lens and to focus on the experiences of black academics with disabilities, queer academics with disabilities, and in particular, neurodivergent academics with disabilities. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and for attending the seminar. And I'm happy to answer any questions and exchange in a mutual discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. Um, I, I, I guess I want to, because I have unmuted, I am going to applaud on behalf of everybody um, uh, to say thank you very much indeed for what was a very measured and a very well-planned um, presentation. Um, and I can see lots of virtual hand claps uh, appearing. Um, we do, as you say, uh, have some opportunity for questions. So I'm, I'm not sure if you're going to need, do you, you need to take down your slides. Perhaps we'll have guidance from Dee or Rebecca. Yeah, I can, um, I can close the presentation. And then we'll see you and possibly others. Ah. That is great. So we can see a range of people here and um, some very positive um, feedback in the chat. Clap, clap, clap. Um, and also an excellent presentation. So we've got an Thank opportunity you. now for some questions. If anyone would like to perhaps either turn on their camera and ask a question or put a question in the chat. So I should just have a little look to see if there are any there. Just whilst people are um, perhaps thinking what their questions might be, I wondered, Marco, you and I have spoken on a number of occasions, but I wondered if you could say a little bit more about the enforced disclosure. Mm -hmm. And in particular, thinking about the enforced disclosure where somebody is perhaps by senior, senior colleagues or perhaps the context forced to disclose themselves or more particularly, that dis enforced disclosure where somebody does it on their behalf. So in effect, as you just said, somebody outed them. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could sort of talk a little bit about um, the extent to which your interviewees gave insights as to whether they're, you know, either of those was more or less um, disabling or uh, in inhibiting or um, constraining on people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I try to answer it as <laughs> best of my abilities. So if people have to disclose, as I said, due to their disability declaring itself, becoming more severe um, or more disabling by the condition itself, um, this is more of a, of a shameful process in the academic's life. So they have to admit openly that there is <laughs> something wrong, but you know, there, well, in, <laughs> there is nothing wrong with them. But this is, of course, shaped by a societal image of health, illness, chronic health conditions. Um, and this is more like, yeah, as I said, an, a shameful process and coming outing themselves and saying, OK, I cannot do this and that. And I would need this and that kind of support or accommodation. If we change the perspective, we could also say the environment is disabling or in more social disability model that the environment is not made for disabled academics to thrive, to work, to teach. And so they are in a way pressured to come out and say, I need this and this kind of support, but basically your environment of, doesn't offer this in the first place. Um, there are other instances in, which I have not included in the presentation because it's a very vast um, and dense interview material. Um, there are um, situations where academics are forced to disclose to others in a more radical way than emails being sent around um, to, the entire, to the institute, which is, of course, one of the most violent 
um, and, and disabling practices, outing someone and sending emails or sending messages to an institute of 100 or, or, or more people, or even to one person, you know, this is never okay. Um, but there are instances where people are forced to disclose, and uh, we talked about this, there's an academic who is forced to knock on the on her colleagues doors they ha she has to go to the entire institute and explain herself that when she's not working and she calls in sick that is uh, she's sick due to her chronic health conditions um and then she has to go to every colleague and explain well when i'm sick i cannot work um i'm chronically ill i'm staying at home i have to rest i cannot answer emails um outing herself face to face pressured by her superior and this mm -hmm. is like this is a very hostile and very damaging behavior um, and it's always related um, as the interviews illustrate to the precarious employment conditions and these expectations of productivity performance competitiveness so when she's home not working and she's calling sick it's her right to be sick to rest <laughs> taking care of the body what i would refer to as crip time or as others refer to it as crip time um, so she has to explain or she has to justify that when she's at home, she cannot do the work expected from her. Um, and this is kind of, you know, it, there's a connection being made between the academic performance and the chronic condition, um, which is wrong on so many levels. Um, so there are some radical or more radical practices than writing an email and uh, outing oneself virtually. Mm. Yes, the idea that one's got to use one's energy and efforts to then go around and tell everybody seems to me to be outrageous, yeah, yeah. but but we will move on. We have a yeah. number of questions coming in, Marco, so um, I will, with your permission, uh, move to Jan. I don't know if you'd like to turn your camera on, Jan, and ask your question. From the forest with the bluebells. <laughs> Marco, these are the this is the woodland walk, um, and for people uh, who who can't can't see the image, this is the woodland walk around our campus, and it's bluebell time. So just for that, um, I don't quite know how to phrase my question, but what I'm interested in is as you've talked about many many, the recognition of many many different and diverse forms of disability. If we start to think about mental health issues and so on. We start to be broadening this pool of who is being disabled in higher education. And it, I just wonder whether the dichotomy of talking about the disabled and the non-disabled is really helpful because I think we've, we're actually, it's a very old fashioned idea that the disabled are this little exclusive group that you know we can see and so forth and obvious but we have many 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 different forms of disability and so actually within the is the dichotomy between disabled and non-disabled still helpful and i understand why we need it but also there is so much diversity within those that we call disabled that can that one phrase really do justice, particularly when we start to think about all the intersectionalities that you mentioned? Thank you, John. Yeah, well, that's a really good question, which I've never asked before. <laughs> I try to find an answer to this. Um, so in general, it's um, the, this dichotomy between this, or let me put it differently, to put all disabled people into one group is never enough. So it's, you know, this is not a, a group of people um, in their sense. As you said, this is a diverse um, conditions. It intersects with other identities. So it's hard to, to frame it as a group, say all disabled people belong to under this umbrella term. But as it shows in the interview, um, it is quite, I don't want to say important, but they are kind of made into this kind of group because there are people in academia who don't experience any kind of conditions, who don't identify uh, therefore as disabled, chronically ill or neurodivergent. So um, by the majority or the more powerful people in place who, are, who don't experience these conditions, they are made into uh, kind of disabled people and kind of put into this kind of group. So this, this term or this dichotomy more or less, yeah, functions um, 
to high. Hmm. Oh, it's a good question. <laughs> um, if it functions to highlight that there that there is a difference, um, but this difference is not necessarily made by the disabled people, but by the non-disabled people, um, to in, in order to differentiate them, uh, the disabled ones from from the non-disabled peers. Um, so yeah, it's, the the umbrella term disabled is yeah not not enough to grasp all the di diversions of disability. But in a sense, they belong to this group because they experience ableism and discrimination. And in this sense, they belong to this kind of term. I th think perhaps just to, just to come in there as well, Marco, I think it's uh, a few years ago since I was doing some research where we were uh, into this was with students, but we were interviewing different groups of students who had particular impairments. And actually, what was very interesting was that the students at the time who had mental health uh, difficulties did not wish to have the disab disability label. And I think sometimes the way some of these labels are uh, sort of um, positioned will vary according to specific context. So again, um, uh, attending a seminar that Marco was giving elsewhere, there was discussion around the percentage of, again, this was students, but the percentage of students who had dyslexia yeah. or a specific learning difficulty. And in Germany, that is a very, very small number of students. Whereas within the UK, up until very recently, that was a very that, that's been the main group of disabled students, um, but but has been a group of students, but not necessarily from a staff perspective, because people are not have either managed to develop strategies or have not wanted to disclose, as some as Marco has highlighted. Um, um, can, can I, oh. Could, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you yes, go first. <laughs> to, if you come back, Jana, and then Marco, and then I'm going to move to our next question, um, which is from Claire. I just I think the um, one of the implications of what I was asking is that disabling can be done by somebody who is disabled because somebody may be a wheelchair user and have uh, no sensitivity whatsoever for people with mental health conditions or vice versa. And so I think that's sort of what I was getting to by saying about the difficulty of this big term. And, and I think we would have to, I think that's quite an uncomfortable thing to say, and I, I don't mean it in a, in a bad way, but I think we have to accept, given the diversity, that that is what will be happening. Um, I'll, I'll let Marco say, and then I shall highlight a particular example that I have of my own in that very vein, Jan. Uh, Marco. Is, yeah, this is quite interesting because um, when I was writing and advertising the, the call for participation for the study, I used the term academics with chronic illnesses or impairments because sometimes the, the term disability is so negatively connotated that, that people don't associate themselves with this term. And even in the interviews, most of them referred to as being chronically ill, being impaired, uh, being impaired or having impairments or having chronic illnesses. But at the same time, they acknowledged while they were speaking that they are disabled by their environment, whether this is socially uh, or professionally, but they hardly use the word disability or disability themselves. So I don't have a disability because most of them associated it with wheelchair users or people with visual impairments or who are blind but not who have like yeah chronic conditions um, which is kind of interesting and um maybe this is also the reason why there are i have basically no neurodivergent um people in the sample because most of them don't um associate with the term chronic illness or or impairment because conditions like adhd or autism are no illnesses they have nothing to be cured uh, this is a neurodiverse diverse conditions. Uh, I myself have ADHD. Um, and so I've, I was learning along the process. And this is, you know, using specific terms is crucial to getting to people, addressing people. And um, I totally support the idea that we have to differentiate or find other terms that are more inclusive or understand the, the diversity of the conditions. Uh, uh, absolutely. And, and, and just to illustrate the point that Jan was uh, mentioning about in terms of some 
people who might have a particular uh, impairment or disability um, really being quite hostile towards others. So I was interviewing somebody, and as I mentioned earlier, I am a wheelchair user, and I was in person, physically present with this person I was interviewing, and they had a specific learning difficulty. And in the course of the interview, um, they spoke very strongly about how it would be the worst possible thing in the world to be disabled and be in a wheelchair. Now, what was quite strange was that I was sitting in my wheelchair, but I had to, as the interviewer, uh, you know, listen to the comments. And actually, I think sometimes we often see things in our own perspective. So I think that's just sort of illustrating. Now, I think in terms of, you know, that raised for me all sorts of um, ethical and methodological issues and considerations. And that comes not very nicely to a question from Claire. Um, and she asks, could you give me a bit more detail about the methodology you used? Um, the part particularly about deductive and inductive method of analysis um, that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, during the interviews, I, oh, I was pinned. Okay. <laughs> so during the interviews, uh, I used an interview guide. Um, the interview guide was based on previous research on um, disability disclosure and ableism. So this was an interview guide for several topics I asked the participants about. Um, and as is part of qualitative research, um, the I wanted to have some kind of structure in order to compare the interviews and not to forget important parts that are relevant to my research questions, but I was wanted to be open to the participants' responses. Um, so the interviews were analyzed within a method that is combining the content I have from the interview guide and the topics that emerged from the interview material. So first of all, the whole interviews or the whole transcripts were uh, well, I, I built main thematic categories that I derived deductively based on the interview guide. So uh, the interview material was then coded with the main categories. I developed 15 categories that emerged from the interview guide. This included, as I said, um, disclosure at the workplace, reactions from colleagues and staff, um, experiencing of disability and academia of ableism, um, current career prospects, employment conditions, uh, support and accommodation inside and outside academia. Those were all topics that I have developed within the interview guide. Um, and after I have had coded the interview material with the main categories, um, I looked for subcategories that I have developed um, inductively based on the interview material. Um, so there were many topics that I could not anticipate um, before, and which was quite interesting um, during the interviews. And then the subcategories were built from the interview material. And then the final step, all the interviews were coded both with the main categories and the subcategories, which I differentiated along the process. I hope this gives an answer. <laughs> and Myself, yeah, this thank is... You. Thank you for that, oh, yeah. Marco. I, I don't know if Claire has any follow up that she wishes to ask um, just for further clarification. She'd be most welcome either to pop it in the chat or to come online. And, you know, also it's, it's, it's quite interesting because um, at some point, you know, I, I've read a lot of literature before the interviews, but there are things, specific situations and specific side effects of the impairment itself from education whatever, which is related to academia that you cannot possibly think about before. And this is quite interesting um, to, to have these interviews. And I was really lucky that the participants were willing to share their stories in a very long way. Um, and at some point, you know, I also adapted the interview guide because there were many topics emerging from the first one, two, three interviews that I included then in the interview guide um, so that I don't miss it in, in the other interviews. But mm -hmm. yeah, there were topics coming up in, in every interview, which I had not anticipated. So, well, I don't want to say because, you know, there's no trigger warning in the chat, but where certain themes that came up in the first and the second, the same topic coming up in all the interviews, which was quite interesting to see how similar some experiences can be when it comes to ableism in academia. I'll just before moving to John, Sorry. I'll yes. just uh, allow Claire to, to return back and ask anything further if she wishes to. 
I can see she's Hello, come Marco. on soon. Hello, Marco. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, that's a perfect answer. Thank you. I kind of just missed it as you were talking about it. I was trying to take notes and I'm like, no, I missed something then. What <laughs> happened? <laughs> um, so, yes, thank you. That was perfect. That's brilliant. Thanks very much. Thank you, Not at all. Thank, thank you for that, Claire. Um, and, and John raises a really in, in, interesting question as well, which I'll yeah. allow him to ask for himself. John. OK, Please. thank you. Um, I'm afraid I haven't got any nice trees or plants behind me, but um, <laughs> I am sitting looking out of my study on a Lake District fell with young lambs and in the sunshine. So uh, I'm, I'm, I've got something to look at. Now, what I was interested in your your presentation, and thank you for that, um, concentrated mainly on relationships, uh, I think, between the staff with with colleagues or with senior managers and leaders and i'm interested in actually how uh, issues of disclosure as far as their students are concerned and i i have in mind um a sort of personal experiences um this goes back a, a long time now but i remember when i was a student there was a particular lecturer um who clearly had some sort of disability um, students we as students we weren't aware quite but all sorts of rumors started and people used to say things and and some are sometimes quite unpleasant really now later on I actually got to know that lecturer very well indeed he became a very good friend of mine and I became aware of you know he he told me the the disability that was concerning and he also shared with me how much he had grappled with the issue of whether he should tell his students or not mm. um you know was this something to to share with his students he actually had, i don't think had any particular problem about sharing it with his colleagues and senior staff and so on, but he had a real issue about whether he should share it with his students. Um, and I was just wondering whether that cropped up in, in any of your research and your interviews and, and what, your, what your feelings were on, on that side of disclosure. Mm -hmm. So here is basically the opposite. So participants are very open to disclose their conditions to their students, um, basically because this is, uh, where it seems from the interviews that students are more understanding and acceptance of their conditions um, and the working or career prospects not directly depend um, on the students understanding um, but most of the participants have a good relationship with their students um, and they feel open uh, as I remember <laughs> feel open to, to disclose their conditions of course this depends in large part if they have accepted their conditions themselves if they even know what to disclose or what or not to tell. Um, there are some instances where participants, um, I remember this very vividly, uh, this is not a focus of the analysis, but I remember that um, there are certain practices of you know, feeling, feeling forced to hide their conditions so that the students, so that their, that their performance does not affect their work. Um, I'm not sure due to ethical reasons if I should engage too directly in this, but some academics um, have certain kind of habits or procedures or know how to hide their conditions. So students become not aware um, of their conditions. Um, I don't want to say this now because then, you know, people might pay attention how people do their teaching or whatever. Um, and yeah, but, but in general, the, the relationships are good and um, they get a positive feedback from this. Um, this is what emerges in many of the interviews that students are understanding and that they come to the academics um, in their in counseling sessions or if they have questions regarding teaching or assignments. Um, and because the, uh, the, the teaching staff or the academics were open to the students, they feel they can be open to, their, uh, to, the, to the teacher and say they have this and this kind of condition. Um, so it seems like, um, yeah, this is a, a mutual benefit. But for the academics, uh, this is, it is easier. Um, and it happens more often to disclose towards students um, than to colleagues or superiors. Mm. Thank you. 
Thank you for that, Marco. I think, I mean, as a general observation, it, it's it's also, oh no, I'm just highlighted, sorry. <laughs> I thought I'd muted myself. Changing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I think as a general observation, I think often students will find that they will perhaps go and disclose information to staff who have disclosed something in a sense to them. Um, but whether that is, as, as you were saying, is something that's perhaps a more recent context as but, opposed um, to what John was saying earlier. But maybe to add, because I'm always coming back to this new neoliberal academia and these, these high expectations and demands to be always productive and always available what i found out in the interviews is that they only disclose uh, well <laughs> that non-disclosure doesn't affect their work so they're always trying to find ways that they come to universities fulfill their work duties um, and make sure that students learn so this is quite interesting because it's always under this this yeah they always <laughs> I want, to, I want to say this positively, they give in into these, these academic pressures and the demanding workplace, but, you know, working, teaching, um, doing research with disabilities never affects their work. And this is quite also in a kind of dis, uh, difficult situation because most of them try to make sure that everything is fine at the workplace um, before they feel entitled to take care of themselves. Um, so, but, you know, the, the work performance is never... Um, it does is never affected by non-disclosure or disclosure in any way. Mm, thank you. This is good um, and bad at the same time. That's right. We've we've a few more minutes, so I wondered if there are any more questions from those in the in the group. Otherwise, I will chip in with another one, as you might imagine, Marco. <laughs> I'm imagining now. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, well, something else that I'd like to ask, which is sort of building on your research, but also thinking a little bit about future research and also perhaps drawing a little bit on your experiences of your time here at Lancaster in comparison to the German context, because I know we've had many conversations about um, the different way in which Germany is um, f functioning as a, as, a, as a country and in terms of the way it funds staff and the way its staffing structures operate. Um, but I, I wondered if there was anything that you wanted to sort of share by way of comparison in terms of what you've observed and experienced, perhaps, whilst you've been interacting with colleagues and students here at Lancaster. So I have to <laughs> um, <laughs> take the word wisely, otherwise I will get fired. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. no. um, but if, if, if I take a look at the Lancaster experience, um, well, it starts with being able to experiencing Lancaster University in an online or virtual setting. Um, and this is quite, well, it's positively overwhelming, quite new to me. Um, I feel like that, well, I can only speak from my experience at this university, mm. but the Lancaster University has engaged in this virtual digital setting um, from, in my opinion, very excellently. Um, so starting with the pandemic, um, what I've heard and seen, you know, switching to online and virtual meetings, and in particularly, and, um, you know, you made sure that my transition to Lancaster University has been as smoothly and accessible as possible. There are many accessible, um, aspects which I have not experienced before here in Germany. So that rec that sessions or events are being recorded as we do now, that we option live caption or live captions. Um, and uh, speaking of the inclusive learning network, I know that you uh, take a look at the recordings and correct the captions so that every word um, is, every spoken word is equivalent to the captions. Um, yeah, I spoke about recording sessions, about personal development and training. So I've um, discovered the Lancaster Digital Skills Certificate, um, which I've been able to participate in, taking courses in mental health awareness, in EDI training, um, creating accessible resources in cultural competencies. And all these courses are fully accessible, which is quite new to me. You know, there are videos. Um, with captions, with loud voices, the slides are made in um, 
<laughs> in good colors and a good contrast. So not get overwhelmed by too many information and too many changes in colors. Um, slides or home pages are being read out to me. Um, and this is uh, an excellent experience. I'm hoping I can take some of this with me and uh, present to the graduate schools um, and institutions here. Um, and um, what I've experienced is people ask me, um, as you said, I give another presentation in the Disabled Employee Network, and they approached me and asked me, what time do I want to present? And this is quite new, like people asking what time of the day is perfect for me uh, to get up and, you know, to being able to talk um, in, a, in a relaxed sense. And, and you know, I felt even... Um, safe to disclose and saying, well, it would be okay for me to speak in the afternoon. I have this and that condition. Um, and being granted so much, much flexibility and accessi accessibility um, made me feel safe to disclose. Um, and I didn't have to ask for anything. This is quite interesting because it was either offered or it was already in place. And this is not, you know, you're not forcing me to say this, I can assure no, you. No, I, I, <laughs> like, I will have, I have to put to say a caveat these nice words that I haven't or... paid you. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, I said it to other people as well, in, 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 to colleagues here at my university, um, that there are many, you know, speaking of universal design and universal design learning, there's so much in place. Um, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with mental illness and ADHD and several other conditions. Um, and my stay or my virtual stay was made more accessible um, and smooth than I've ever experienced in my whole student or academic life. Um, and yeah, so I think we can learn here in Germany a lot from my experience here, from the things that you're offering. Um, and yeah, yeah, I, I get, uh, there are hundreds of things that come up to my mind, which I can say now, but yeah, it's, it's uh, absolutely great that, of course, there are things that are missing. Um, mm. You know, it, yeah, it's, it's, you know, but, but for most of the part, or for, for me, it was made accessible and I was able to participate, experiences, gaining knowledge, sharing knowledge, um, and it was never unpleasant um, and was never a burden. Um, and I was always happy to participate. And of course, Lancaster University has a variety of topics related to my research project, uh, the whole EDI topics that are presented in the Inclusive Learning Network and the Disabled Employee, what we uh, do in REAP or with the new project you and Joe have um, um, brought to, to the REAP group. Um, and it, it's quite interesting to see how many topics are connected and we speak of disability and um, LGBTQ identities, um, Black, Indigenous, people of color experiences. So this is, yeah, the variety of topics in relation to disability directly or indirectly makes it a joy to participate um, because it's not only this one category, um, but there is more an intersectional approach, what I see here at Lancaster. Um, and so this is, yeah, it's great. That, that, that's a very fulsome answer, <laughs> uh, Marco, uh, and, I, and I should say I haven't paid Marco in that answer, but I think it has been really helpful because I think what's very interesting is that you have helped certainly myself and I, I know others to recognise some of the things perhaps that we are doing, but also to think about ways in which we need to share some of those practices across our university and elsewhere but also the things that we can then still build on. So, you know, it, for me, this is an area of work that, you know, one never finishes, but one can always be building on. And you've really been able to enhance us with today's seminar. Um, and there have been numerous um, comments in the chat, which I hope you will have opportunity to have a look at um, in terms of thanks, a hugely informative uh, presentation. People have learned a lot um, and that they, requests for copies of your slides etc which we will make available to those who, sure. who need them i just so, want um, just one thing to add because it, it came indeed. to our mind and it it emerges also from the interviews i've conducted um so be, being disabled or chronically ill in in academia and higher education which is most of the most important thing is flexibility um working learning in different locations, whether this is at home or whether this is on campus or in the office. Um, and this relates both to the research I've conducted and my own experiences, the flexibility um, 
to participate in events, uh, but not feeling forced to participate um, or, or feeling pressured to, to come to every meeting or to every session, but saying, okay, we have this knowledge stored. They are recorded. We're sharing slides, slides in an accessible format, which is very important, both in PDF, both in PowerPoint. Um, and what is most important to me is transparency and clear instructions um, in terms of giving a talk here today. And I want to thank Dee also, um, who played a great part in organizing this. Um, I have a certain time. I have a certain date. I know how long the presentation is going to be, where to find copyright pictures, how I can create accessible slides. And then all the information given. So I don't have to worry about like, what is going on? How do I do this and this? There was a clear description uh, with several points which I can work through and which helps me giving a presentation, which helps me um, yeah, deliver a talk and you know, not to worry about anything. There were all information there and yeah, transparency and reliable um, fixed events. And this is very, yeah, it's a great experience. So thanks you, Dee, as well. Well, I know, um, I am sure many speakers would wish to thank Dee and also Rebecca and also oh, yeah. Kung yeah. Mi, who oversees yeah. the, the, <laughs> the programme. So if I could perhaps invite those still present, maybe to unmute their microphones for us to give a little audio um, applause to Marco, uh, or if not, use your, your visual reaction button, but say thank you very, very much indeed, Marco. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. And so it's now my time to, to, to close our presentation um, and to tell you that our next seminar, uh, online seminar that is, will take place on Wednesday the 25th of May 2022 and will be presented by Jessica Wren Butler. And she's a doctoral student um, in the Department of Sociology and our Department of Educational Research here at Lancaster. And the title of this presentation is, you get your training and it's basically ref, ref, ref. Unbelonging, exclusion, and the research excellence framework. And this is obviously a very timely presentation, given the fact that we have just within the UK context been receiving the ref 21 results. Um, but I think her title highlights that perhaps all is not always smooth. So I'm sure this will be a fascinating presentation. I wish, thank all who've been present for the interesting questions and a final thanks to Marco and those who've organized. And I wish you all a good day or good evening or good morning, depending on where you are. Many thanks. <laughs>